Well, 2023 will be dominated by the NATO war against Russia, as indeed 2022 was. From February 25 until this day, there is no bigger story anywhere in the world, and its shadow has loomed over all political, economic, social, and cultural developments of the previous 12 months, and that is not going to change. How do I know? Because the head of NATO, a tailor from Norway called Stoltenberg, or something like that, has just actually announced pronunciamento just before I came on the air that the Ukraine war is going to last a long time. That kind of renders Otios my poll for the evening which was, will the Ukraine war be over this year? My vote would have been no in any case, although thousands of people have been voting, and it is a close-run thing, at least until the tailor from Norway spoke. If NATO say it's going to be a long war, that means it is, because it is NATO that has made the war in the first place, not in the last 10 months, that's absurd. Only a fool now clings to that canard. But in the last eight years, perhaps in the last 14 years, NATO has been determined to use Ukraine as a cat's paw against Russia. And that cat's paw's claws turned toxic and it was inevitable, ineluctable that Russia would intervene. As NATO may well have wanted them to do, that is a distinct possibility. What they cannot have wanted was for the inventories of the NATO powers to be empty on New Year's Day, for that is what they are. It is abundantly clear now that Russia could march all the way to Berlin, all the way to Paris, and NATO could do nothing about it except fire nuclear weapons, which would be repaid in kind, and then the end of the world would be upon us. But short of nuclear catastrophe, the NATO armies have nothing left to fire. One by one, the American inventory, the German inventory, the British inventory has steadily emptied. But the Russian inventory has not. The Russian military-industrial complex has already established in the last 10 months that it is infinitely superior to the Western one. And of course, armies don't just march on their stomach. They don't march at all unless they have the logistics and the weapons to fire. So in that regard, it's 1-0 to Russia in this NATO-Russia conflict. In fact, it's several more goals to the good for Russia than that which I shall now adumbrate, but before leaving the issue of logistics, Russia is now on a full war footing, whatever they say. They don't announce uh, that there's going to be total mobilization, but it's my belief that in 2023, there will be increasingly total mobilization. Uh, the oligarchs that were still at large and still at their anti-patriotic games are now actually beginning to be cracked down upon where they're not falling from tall windows in high buildings. Uh, the oligarchs are being cracked down upon because this has become a great patriotic war for Russia. The Russian people are fully behind their government, not 100%, of course, even our government in 1940 and 41 had a fifth column of 10 or 20 percent. Unfortunately for us, most of ours were in the palace, in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and in the upper reaches of the British establishment. But Russia has about 20 percent of its population in a fifth column also, although helpfully for Russia, many of those have now fled abroad. But the motherland, as was the note struck by Putin in his address yesterday for the new year, is what the Russians 
are now fighting for. And as the world ought to know, when the Russians are fighting for their motherland, they cannot be defeated, at least not by a ragtag and bobtail coalition uh, of the weird and the wonderful. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, let alone the Netherlands, but the idea that the Netherlands is going to fight Russia is, I promise you, entirely fanciful. It is entirely fanciful that the Spanish or the Portuguese or the Czechs, or the Slovaks, or the Romanians, or the Bulgarians, or many others that I could mention are going to fight Russia is entirely fanciful. This NATO war, even if you put a Norwegian tailor at the top of it, is an American and British war against Russia. And Russia's been here before. 101 years ago, the British and American armed forces in their hundreds of thousands invaded Russia to try and regime change the new Bolshevik government there. The Soviet Union was proclaimed exactly 100 years ago this year. It's no longer the Soviet Union. Putin is no Lenin. His government are no Bolsheviks. And there are good and bad sides to all of that. But as the Red Army proved in 1943, 44, and 45, it is unbeatable when fighting for its motherland, which is now what it is doing. And therefore, the war can only end one way. It will not end, in my view, this year, but it can only end in a complete Russian victory. And every day that goes by means that the terms of that victory get harder to bear for the coup regime in Kiev and its international patrons. Let me sketch as I've done before, but my ideas are now clearer than before. Russia will take all of the east of the Ukraine, all of the south of the Ukraine, and will link up with Transnistria, liberating it from its limbo, from its purgatory of neither being one thing nor the other, being Russian but not Moldovan, being not Moldovan and not Romanian either. Transnistria and the south of Ukraine will be one entity, along with all of the east of Ukraine, which will all become part of Russia, leaving a rump and landlocked Western Ukrainian state increasingly prey as Medvedev, the new sage of the Russian government, who knew, I never fancied him at all before, but he's one of the few who are publicly laying out what is something approaching a vision for not just Russia, but his anticipation of what's going to happen to the rest of us. The Western Ukrainian rump landlocked state will be increasingly prey, says Medvedev, to Hungarian and Polish depredations, both of whom have their eyes on ancient lands of theirs that only thanks to the aforementioned Bolsheviks were ever in Ukraine in the first place, only thanks to the Red Army were only ever in Ukraine in the first place. So that Western Ukrainian rump, like Kosovo, will be a permanent cross to bear for Western taxpayers. And because those Western taxpayers are going to be forced to continue the self-harm, the harikiri, the economic suicide, of their own economies in the name of fighting Russia, the taxpayer that's shouldering that cross will be increasingly unable to do so. So that Western Ukrainian rump will become an armed camp, just like Kosovo. It will be activated from time to time, just like Kosovo is being activated right now against Serbia and against its big brother, Russia. And the stage is set for a long war. It will not, perhaps, 
be an all singing, all dancing war, an all encompassing war of attrition, at least not once the South and the whole of the East has been liberated from the government in Kiev. But it will be a long war because NATO will move in to that rump state as they have moved into Kosovo and it will be transformed into an armed camp. Millions of Ukrainians will be on the move in other directions, just like the millions of others that have already done so. And like the huge numbers of Kosovans who are to be found in any part of Western Europe. I shan't. I'll spare their blushes by adumbrating where it is that they can usually be found. Now, Medvedev's vision was that this will place increasing stress and strain on the European Union. And I suspect that he may be right about that. We already have, perhaps already have always had a two-speed Europe. Uh, Franco, German, and in the past, Anglo core of the EU with a lot of satellite labor exporting countries around it, net beneficiaries of a central treasury based in the German uh, banking houses, in the great chancery of Berlin. But that chancery is not what it was, and neither is its treasury. And so the appetite of the now Franco-German core of the European Union to continue carrying everyone else is considerably diminished and may disappear altogether, depending on what happens in Germany. I have spent a lot of time talking to you about developments in Germany, and I intend to do so even more in this coming year, because for me, what happens in Germany will determine what happens in all of Europe. In Britain, we are in the SH1T. We have had more prime ministers, chancellors of the Exchequer, home secretaries and foreign secretaries than even I, a political junkie, could possibly remember without an auto cue delivering it extempore to you down this camera. Our political class is shot through. You could measure it by the knighthood that was given this very day to somebody called Chris Bryant. You can search him on the internet. You'll find him in his underpants on uh, some gay dating agency. You'll find him uh, in the list of apologia given for offenses committed against parliamentary protocol defaming people and having to apologize for it. You'll find them in lots of murky corners, Sir Chris Bryant. But never mind. Arise, Sir Chris. You're now a knight of the realm, which does nothing but tell us how cheap is now the realm. How cheap is the realm of the United Kingdom? Well, you can measure that by the fact that we are now apparently forced to call somebody called Camilla our queen. Although she isn't the queen, although she is in fact the queen consort, whatever that means, probably means that she consorted with the man that is now the king behind his wife's back for many years and played a considerable role in driving the actual queen of hearts, Lady Diana, completely mad. It was Camilla what done it. She drove her completely mad. And you could say, therefore, contributed to her unfortunate demise in a tunnel in Paris. Uh, this adulteress was herself married and the mother of several children during all of those years that she carried out her sordid affair with the man who is now the king. He wanted to be her tampax. Other brands are available, but you ought to know that it is a sanitary uh, precaution that women of a certain age insert into themselves when menstruating. He was caught on tape describing how he wanted to be Camilla's Tampax. That's how cheap is the realm. 
But these are merely the fripperies of the realm. The real realm is in Whitehall and in Westminster, and that realm has never looked more threadbare. I'm going to predict to you that the British government will collapse in the course of 2023, and that we will have a general election, and that a block of wood called Sir Keir Starmer already tried and tested for roadworthiness by NATO, by the EU, by the United States and the ruling elite and found to be entirely trustworthy. He is their pick. They cannot accept this Johnny, come lately, Rashid Sunuk as their prime minister because Rashid has no political strength neither in his own party in Parliament and, let me tell you, his current rating in the public opinion polls in the United Kingdom. Rashid Sanuk today commands the support, loyalty and voting intention of just 19% of the British people. I warned the Tories when they got rid of Boris Johnson. He was the only man that could have saved their bacon. Thank God they got rid of him. But don't think that Keith Starmer is going to make any difference to you. Our economy is in a nosedive, the bottom of which cannot yet be viewed. The British economy is almost in free fall and it isn't going to improve. Our workers are on the cobbles demanding that they must minimize the wage cut that their employers are currently offering them. That can only grow, and the anger can only grow when the billions that could have been spent on our own workforce, on our own nurses, on our own railway workers, on our own labor are handed over to a cross-dressing pornography actor called Vladimir Zelensky. The rest of the public has not yet caught up with this diminutive dwarfish figure. They do not yet know that he has made off with their prize. But in the course of 2023, they're going to find out good and proper. And they'll probably find out first here on the mother of all talk shows. I told you to stay tuned. It's the mother of all talk shows.